the most powerful storm ever to make landfall. But was the Philippines caught off guard by Typhoon Haiyan? And what can the international community do in the face of such a disaster? This is an Inside Story special. Welcome to the program. I'm Veronica Pedroza, and I'm overlooking Palok Cathedral in Leyte Island, which is one of the most devastated areas that was struck by Typhoon Haiyan more than a week ago. Services have been taking place here to remember the thousands of people who are dead. There is no official count yet of just how many that is. This was one of the world's most powerful storms ever. Typhoon Haiyan smashed into the Philippines on Friday, November the 8th. Satellite pictures showed the sheer size of the storm. At one stage, about 600 kilometers across, with winds gusting at up to 300 kilometers an hour. The provinces of Cebu, Bohol, and Leyte were the worst affected. Later's provincial capital, Tacloban, was all but destroyed, swept away by a five-metre storm surge, and Haiyan exacted a deadly toll. More than 3,600 people are known to have died. More than 1,000 people are unaccounted for, and about 11 million have been directly affected by the storm. But as the president, Benigno Aquino, makes his second visit to Tacloban, questions are being asked about the government's response to this crisis, with many people still without food and water. We'll be looking at the international relief effort in just a moment and the difficulties that the Philippines is facing getting aid to those who need it most. But first, we want to remind you of the moment that the storm actually struck. Al Jazeera's Jamela Alindogan was in Tacloban. It was a vicious force that paralyzed the entire province of Leyte. Typhoon Haiyan swept through the central Philippines early Friday morning. It destroyed everything in its path. Power lines, roads, coastal villages, all wiped out in an instant. The typhoon arrived three hours earlier than expected. Thousands of people were trapped when water rose as high as five meters. We were one of them, right at the eye of Haiyan's wrath. Now we're trying to make our way out of this place. This is what a little over three hours of the wrath of Typhoon Haiyan has brought into this town of Tacloban. This place has become a ghost town. Just a few hours ago, we were ourselves caught up in the middle of what is considered the most powerful typhoon in the world this year. It was hard because at some point we were preparing for a live and all of a sudden the water started going up and before we knew it, we were by the ceiling clinging for our lives. Um, it's a miracle that we survived and what we really need to do now is to make our way out of here because there's nothing left, only destruction and death. It was the world's most powerful typhoon on record and the damage for a small province like Leyte is unprecedented. Yes, we are. Uh, antibiotics. The governor says he fears that at least 20,000 people are dead. And those who survived face far more difficult days ahead. The entire province is isolated. Thousands have been left homeless unsure exactly where to go, searching for shelter in the few structures that remain standing. Almost everyone here has a family member or a friend who has died. The reality too hard for many to grasp. We almost drowned. It's so difficult. We have nothing left. No place to sleep. Not even dry clothes to wear. We were in the gymnasium, which is supposed to be our evacuation center, but it just suddenly collapsed. Everyone started to run everywhere to save their own lives. This hospital is one of the few establishments still operating after the typhoon. But doctors here are working under strained conditions, operating on the injured without electricity and clean water. 
and their short supply of medicine is running out. Most of the areas remain unreachable. The dead, the wounded, and those who survived cut out from the rest of the world. And as night falls, people here become even more desperate. The devastation is staggering, but the true extent of the damage remains unknown. Jamal Alin Dogan, Al Jazeera, Palo Leite, Central Philippines. I'm joined now by Patrick Fuller, who's the communications manager for the Asia-Pacific region of the International Federation of Red Cross and Crescent Societies. Good to have you here, Patrick. I know we've worked together on so many uh, of complex disasters in this region. We just have far too many of them. How does this compare with others? Well, there are some obviously comparisons with the tsunami in 2004 in Aceh and Sri Lanka, although that affected a much wider area. That was across 13 countries and also Japan. You just have to look around you at the absolute devastation. I mean, the town of Tacloban, towns all down the coast of, of Leyte, completely devastated. So what does that really mean in terms of the needs and the impact on the population? It means basically that hundreds of thousands effectively of people are without homes and we face a major issue in terms of what happens to these people. It's going to be a long-term operation for international organizations like the Red Cross. We're going to have to commit considerable resources. And there are going to be multiple needs here. I mean, not just immediate needs like food relief, like tarpaulins to put over the shell of your house, but also you've got to think about the psychological needs. I mean, people are going to need some level of help to get through the trauma of this. What about the first response in a disaster like this? It seemed like there was a really long time lag. Not really. I mean, again, I think there's a, there's a misconception about just how long it takes for the international community to mobilize resources that are required for a, a disaster of this scale. I mean, first responders in emergencies are always local organizations, people from neighboring towns, friends, relatives, small groups. I mean, the Philippines Red Cross, you know, they've had 136 people here since this disaster happened. They've been trucking in food, taking water to the hospital. But we have to scale it up. We have to scale it up massively. And it takes at least a week, up to two weeks, really, for the logistics pipeline to bring materials in from, I mean, we're bringing in materials from Dubai, from Kuala Lumpur, from Europe, I mean, all over the place. But if I remember rightly, the 2004 tsunami aid was getting in quicker. Aid was getting in quicker. And I think basically a lot more organizations were, in, were involved there. But in many respects, it wasn't, because it was such a huge area. If you remember back to the, the coastline of Aceh, I mean, it was totally inaccessible. We had to actually, the Red Cross had to bring in specially designed vehicles to get into some of these towns. We had to look at every option, taking material by boat, and it was pretty slow. But I mean, the issue between Aceh and here is, what are we going to do with these thousands of people who are in evacuation centers? Are we looking at tented camps? It's going to be long-term solutions that we really need to think about now. Are you getting the kind of support that you need? I saw that um, the United Nations, together with other international aid organizations, had uh, appealed initially for 300 million US. Um, the funding is coming in. I mean, we've got a lot of soft pledges coming in. We, the International Federation of Red Cross launched an appeal for 80 million US dollars. That's just a preliminary appeal. That, that number will go up considerably when we look at the long-term recovery needs. So we've committed to an 18-month emergency program, but I imagine we will be here for years beyond that on this sort of longer-term initiatives. Um, can you make the link for me between the kind of big picture planning that you guys do there's like a sort of massive international aid master plan and the fact that when i go around to villages like tan awan and talk to just the guys who managed to make it through uh with nothing and aid's not reaching them how do you make that bridge so that so that i don't know is it a communications thing is it a distribution thing it's a number of things. I mean, like I said, it takes, you know, at least a week, 10 days, two weeks to ramp up the international response. I was in Tanawan yesterday and I saw trucks coming through. This was gov government supplies coming through. I think we're turning the corner now. You know, food is, is definitely reaching these areas, but the concern is it's not reaching everywhere at the moment. 
but I think you'll see a very different picture in a week to ten days. I mean, establishing those links, to give you a sense, it took, it took the Philippine Red Cross five days to bring a convoy of 15 trucks down here from Manila, moving at 30 kilometers an hour. That's in-country, that's an in-country response. Think about how long it takes to mobilize 14 emergency response units that we have on the way, some of which have arrived from Belgium. We're bringing in a hospital. We're bringing in a hospital from Norway and Canada and Japan. We're an entire hospital? An entire hospital, yeah. And we're bringing in all sorts of emergency response units to handle logistics, to handle the relief, to establish a base camp. It's a massive system, but it's a system that's in place. It's a well-honed system that we've deployed in many different operational contexts. And we also have regional logistics hubs in Dubai where we're bringing in vehicles, things like tarpaulins, kitchen sets, and also from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, one thing that I've noticed is that there are a lot of aid organizations here. Some of them I've never heard of, some of them are very big, like, like yours. Um, there seems to be a kind of multiplication of aid organizations at these disasters nowadays. Is that um, something that impacts the way that you work? I think it definitely does. I mean, talking to some of my colleagues who've been involved in the coordination mechanisms here, working with the government, there are a lot of organizations, both local and international, who sort of jump in. They might send five medical staff who don't really arrive fully equipped with medicines, with fuel, with water. And you've got to remember, there has been nothing here. There's been no food in the shops. You, money is, is worthless here, basically. So what happens is they end up, you know, asking the Red Cross or other organizations for support. And what we want to avoid in this, which is what happened in, in the tsunami in 2004, is that duplication. There was a lot of organizations going to the same place, dropping aid without sufficient coordination and consultation. Now, you've got to bear in mind also, the local authorities here have been hit hard. Everyone's been hit. You know, people have lost family members, but they continue to go to the office every day to try and pull all of this together. So I have a lot of sympathy for, for the government here. And they are putting in place some very, very good measures. You know, this one-stop shop whereby customs clearance, it will all happen within 24 hours. That's what the government's saying. And we're seeing a very smooth process, actually, getting a lot of our equipment in. All right. Thanks very much indeed, Patrick Fuller of the Red Cross, and good luck with the operation. Al Jazeera has managed to get to some of the remotest areas in which the typhoon Haiyan hit. One of them, Bantayan Island in northern Cebu. Here's Step Varsen's report. They are the forgotten victims of Haiyan. The people in the islands north of Cebu are left to their own fate. Although most managed to survive, they too have lost their homes. We're on an eerie journey, trying to verify reports that populations of some small islands have been wiped out. We're heading to Ginatakan, an island with a population of 1,800. One report saying they all died, luckily turns out to be untrue. The survivors tell us we are the first visitors in a week. All the islands show the same pattern of destruction. The government has to help us. We're highly affected here and we're getting really hungry, so we really need food. Many residents have decided not to hope for help anymore. Tired of waiting, they are now helping themselves. Nearly one week after Heian, these villages here in Bantayan still look like the storm has just happened. Everywhere you hear the sound of hammering. People are trying to fix their own houses as much as they can. Not only homes, but also livelihoods are destroyed by the typhoon. Some fishing boats are still intact, but many others are damaged and fishing equipment has been destroyed by the wind. Although relief efforts are underway elsewhere, these islanders need help too. Um, but we are, as I've said, we are doing our very best to stand on our own, but that does, that does not certainly mean that we do not need any help because we do and we are appealing to everyone to please send help. The most urgent needs are shelter, blankets and medicine, but there are also shortages of water and food. Although they have been invisible so far, these victims of the disaster say it's about time they got help too. Stepfasen, Al Jazeera, Bantayan, Northern Cebu. So let's find out what the situation on Bantayan Island is right now. Harry Fawcett is there and can tell us. Harry. 
Thanks, Veronica. Yeah, I'm here in the northern city of Madridejos, uh, up at the northern tip of Bantayan Island, and it's what really the, the most severely hit of the three main towns on this island. What didn't happen here, though, and what did happen, obviously, on, on Leyte, where you are, is a, a big storm surge, and that's why the human casualties of the disaster here have been so much less. Three people died here in the typhoon. Uh, a little over 100 were injured, but the force of the winds just ripped this place apart. We came in here by helicopter a little bit earlier uh, today and we saw from the air just almost no uh, structures in this town uh, had a r roof surviving on top of them. The mayor here, uh, Salvador de la Fuente, has told us that about 98% of homes have been utterly destroyed. Uh, mayor de la Fuente, thank you for joining us. Um, just tell us how badly your town has been affected. Well, yeah, it is so very badly because there are most of the houses of my uh, people here in Madridijos are totally damaged because of the yeah, super typhoon Yolanda. Now, um, we have been hearing uh, throughout the, the course of the, the recovery effort from the, the typhoon across the Philippines, criticism of the government response, uh, a lot of isolated communities like yours saying that they didn't get aid fast enough. That doesn't seem to be the case here. Tell us about the aid effort here. Well, yeah, actually, yeah, the national government, they have an action. Yeah, they sent us here uh, first, uh, the uh, doctors from the region and then also the DSWD yeah, visited, visited us here. And, and what came in? Uh, you, you said aid first came, came in on Sunday. What kind of stuff was being delivered? Yeah, they delivered uh, some relief goods yeah, intended for uh, the victims. Okay. And at the moment, uh, people seem to have enough water, enough food to get by day to day. So, so what are the main needs as far as the people here in the city are concerned? Well, yeah, as of now, because they don't have uh, any, they cannot go to fishing because uh, their houses are devastated by the typhoon. Uh, as of now, they need more foods and then also uh, their shelter. Yeah. Well, you can see, I mean, the amount of activity going on here is extraordinary, and a lot of it is people rebuilding their homes. Um, the problem, though, presumably, is that they're being rebuilt in exactly the same way, in, in pretty flimsy structures. So you've got to be worried about the next typhoon, the next big weather event to hit. Yes, uh, actually, I'm so very, I'm, um, I'm just uh, hoping that uh, no more typhoon hit in our place because yeah, at this moment in time, they did not rebuild uh, their houses. Yeah, I hope that uh, they can rebuild first. But, but there are people who are saying that when the affected communities do rebuild, there needs to be greater planning, more money to make sure that they build the kind of homes that can withstand uh, stronger forces from, from nature, which are, are bound to hit the Philippines more and more in the years to come. Is that something that's even realistic when people have so little to begin with? Yeah, actually it is realistic because, uh, you know, yeah, it is, I think, yeah, because of the climate change. So I think it is, uh, it, yeah, it is better for them to rebuild their houses, which is stronger than before. But uh, unfortunately, they don't have enough money. Well, yeah, exactly. Where, where is that money going to come from? That's something that has to be presumably instituted by national government. Is that not right? No, uh, actually, uh, the national government, I hear that uh, they will uh, give more help to those uh, uh, victims. But I, I don't know uh, how much is the amount. Um, now, the main industries, as you're saying here, are fishing, also big poultry farms, piggeries. A lot of that was, was uh, destroyed in the typhoon. How are people sort of managing to make a living? How are people being affected by the, the, the lack of, of industry of work now? Uh, well, uh, because uh, regarding fishing, their, their fishing boats are already destroyed. Um, and then uh, the poultry was also destroyed. Yeah, it depends upon the, the capitalist or the businessman who will give loans to uh, those uh, fishermen and also to the businessmen. And, and describe your own experience of the typhoon when it, when it hit this town. Where were you and, and what did you see? Well, uh, during, the, uh, during that day, yeah, Friday morning, yeah, even uh, Thursday evening, I was there in the municipal municipal hall. I was uh, I was uh, sleeping there overnight, and then until yeah, the typhoon hit our place. I'm so very scared when the typhoon hit our place. It's so very strong wind.
Okay. Well, um, good luck with the recovery effort. Thank you very much for talking to us uh, today, uh, Mayor Salvador de la Fuente. And so that's really the scene here. It's, uh, as, as the Mayor was saying, 98% of the homes here destroyed. People are being incredibly resilient and trying to rebuild as best they can. And it is a story of, of the potluck of all this in terms of the aid that comes in. Some areas, uh, remote as this one is, are getting the help, some aren't. And so in some senses, the people here, despite the utter destruction that's been wrought here, uh, are feeling pretty lucky in a way. All right, thanks very much indeed, Harry Fawcett there on Bantayan Island in northern Cebu. Now, as we've been saying, uh, the aid distribution has been rather uneven, and there is a perception among some people in the typhoon-ravaged area that the reason for that is political. Margot Ortigas explains. Work has been non-stop for days at this national government warehouse. Typhoon victims pack relief goods in exchange for food. These bags are meant to last a family of five for three days. National officials say they've now serviced nearly half of the families affected by Typhoon Haiyan in Leyte province. That's 615,000 people. These sacks of rice are now being transported by the military from a national government warehouse to what's called a local government unit. Now, these are the individual villages that were affected by Typhoon Haiyan. The officials in those villages are then the ones tasked with distributing it to the residents. But there's no guarantee, even under a state of national calamity with the central government's resources focused here, that the aid reaches its ultimate destination. These survivors say they have yet to receive any help and allege that food distribution has been colored by local politics. The village chairman that won the last election is from there. The one who lost is from our area, 62B. Others were given numbers to receive aid, those from that area and from that other area, but not us. National government representatives make the rounds of typhoon-affected areas. They expect to get damage assessments from local officials on each barangay or village and an accounting of the aid already received. I personally go to the barangays to check and verify. Sometimes it is I do it personally, I do the distribution personally, and sometimes I also counter-check. But there is always a way to get around the system. And though aware of the problems, the national government has little more than trust to rely on. We would have to assume that they know where, who needs it most, and, and who needs it more quickly, and how to get it to them. And, and that's an assumption that has worked in every single situation like this. Remember, the Philippines faces 20, 20 storms a year, and this is the way we've always worked in terms of coordinating with the local government. It might be time then to change the system, especially in situations like this, where many of the local officials are victims too. So let's find out more about the aid effort close up. Marga Ortigas is standing by at Tacloban City, which is a hub for the relief effort. Marga, what are you seeing at the moment as far as the aid effort's concerned? Well, the aid pouring in is clearly visible to everyone here. You can see the choppers overhead bringing crates with them. They see the cargo planes coming in. Even ships and trucks are now plying Tacloban streets with the aid coming in. And that's an extra sign of frust uh, extra sign actually for the survivors here who are already feeling desperate that it's just so close, but they feel they're not quite getting it yet because much of that aid actually remains uh, behind walls, either in warehouses or indeed in municipal halls. Because the problem here is that, as we saw in the story earlier, the aid isn't just so easily distributed, meaning it doesn't just come in and immediately there's a queue and they're just handed out to people. There is a lot of cooperation that needs to go on between the national government, international aid agencies, and the local government officials. Now, all in all, that takes a lot of manpower. And also, in terms of um, infrastructure, it needs vehicles and roads to be opened in the towns that are further afield. Now, those problems are still logistical bottlenecks as far as the national government is concerned. So the aid has been pouring in. There is no shortage, they say, of aid pouring in. Their problem still is the logistics in terms of distribution. They just don't even have enough people to get the distribution going in a way that can run smoothly. But the aid agencies here say that things are turning a corner. Situations like this could take between a week to 10 days before a system can be put in place that will run smoothly. 
And that's it for this special edition of Inside Story on Typhoon Haiyan and its aftermath. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. I'm Veronica Pedroza. We're going to leave you with some of the most dramatic images of Typhoon Haiyan and the devastation left behind in the Philippines. Thank you.